I we'll invite you to open a Bible to Acts chapter 16, verse 25, as we continue our summer series looking at the second half of the book of Acts and the movement of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the early church. And as we open our Bibles to hear from God's word, we prepare our hearts and minds to receive it as we go to him in prayer. Our first prayer this morning is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would open them to hear clearly the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that they may hear clearly the word of God and that they may be uplifted and encouraged in their following and faith of Jesus as their Savior. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach clearly God's word and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and his salvation for all who hear and believe. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So as we continue going through the book of Acts, we are looking at the, the spread of the gospel, how God used people that were imperfect like Paul and Silas and Timothy and all these other servants of God to bring the gospel to the world to bring the gospel to the people that needed to hear it, which, if you haven't figured it out, is everybody, right? The, we always say the gospel is for sinners, and that includes you, that includes me, that we, includes everybody that we meet, that Jesus is for everyone. And so last week we saw a couple of stories in Acts chapter 16 of how the gospel goes to everybody. One, an incredibly successful, wealthy, powerful, influential business person, and then also to a discarded, rejected slave girl who was possessed by a demon. And the good news of Jesus is that he and his love and his power to save and redeem is for everybody. It meets all of our needs no matter who we are or what our background is. And today we meet another person who will receive the gospel. He is a Philippian jailer. And so part of the chapter that we skipped in the reading is that after Paul does this miracle of casting out the demon, Everybody gets mad at him because it causes great financial harm to the city and to people in power. And so they have Paul and Silas arrested and they are sitting in jail. Now this will become common for Paul that he will be mistreated, he will be persecuted, he will often be imprisoned and jailed for doing what Jesus called him to do, for sharing the gospel and doing miracles to spread the love of Christ. And so the first thing for us to ponder and think about as we reflect on God's word as followers of Christ is the reality that following Jesus doesn't always mean everything just works out perfectly, right? It doesn't always lead to exactly how you wanted it to go, right? If you're Paul, you're like, I just baptized Lydia and a bunch of people with her, I just saved this girl from a demon and told her about Jesus and the reward for all that good work is you get to go into prison. You get to be jailed, Paul, because they're going to want to silence you and keep you from doing what God has called you to do. So what we're going to encounter in this moment is Paul and Silas giving us an example of what it's like to share the gospel in all circumstances, but it's also gonna be a reminder of what is the gospel that people actually need to hear. So in verse 25, we'll read the story again. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. We'll come back to this line, but what I want you to have in your mind is Paul and Silas view every opportunity in life as an opportunity to worship God and to share the gospel, right? This is a miraculous verse that the first thing that they do after being unlawfully jailed, and we'd know that because later on in chapter 16, all right, and being mistreated for doing exactly what God wanted them to do is we're gonna pray, we're gonna sing some songs, and we're gonna make sure the other prisoners around us 
hear about Jesus. That's an amazing response. And so in verse 26, the miracle happened. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword, was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. So the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said to them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So this story, as much as there's the miracle of Paul and Silas's uh, reaction to the circumstances, as much as there's the miracle of God breaking loose the prison doors and the jail cells and all the chains that were binding them and all the prisoners, the real point and focus of this story for Luke who is there and who is writing it is this question that the jailer asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? Now, if you grew up in church, maybe you, you grew up Lutheran, you probably have a quick answer to that question, right? Just like, oh yeah, I know the answer. And then we move on very quickly. When I was first a pastor and preaching and teaching, I was encouraged by a mentor of mine, because you're always a little nervous when you first start any new endeavor, right? To make sure, and he just told me, he's like, if you just keep talking about Jesus, you'll be okay. And I was like, some of people ask me, like, what's the best advice you ever got in ministry? That, okay? There's all kinds of programs I've been to. There's all kinds of trainings and cert certifications and everything else in the world and leadership and all these things. But the best advice I ever got in ministry was when I was first starting out, a, a, a mentor of mine just told me, if you just keep talking about Jesus, you'll be okay. And so that's what I did. And I remember at one point at another church, someone came up to me and said, you know, all you ever do in your sermons is talk about Jesus. Now, I wasn't sure if they meant that as a compliment or a complaint. You never know with people, you know, right? Body language and tone and all these things. And I said, thank you. And... <laughs> found out it wasn't exactly a compliment, okay? <laughs> uh, and what they wanted to know was, you know, when are you going to get to the real stuff? Right? Now I know, okay, we're in church and you're like, oh, pastor's setting us up because I do that to you all a lot, right? <laughs> and you're like, no, no, the real stuff is Jesus, right? But when you're not in church, <laughs> we're not setting you up in a sermon, and you want to be honest, I can understand that person's question to an extent, right? You know, I already know the answer, right? If you're a believer in Christ, you're like, I grew up in the church, I grew up Lutheran, I know we're saved by grace, I know the answer to the jailer's question is, you just believe in Jesus, right? It's also the next verse, if you're following along, you already know the answer, right? And so we'll say, like, I already know that. So what we want to do is, when do I get to the real stuff? You know, the practical things. The things that will help me out in life and my relationships and family and business and, and whatever else you want to throw on to the list. Now here's the problem with that. Yes, okay, the easy Sunday school, you're in church, sitting in the pews, the answer is, well, Jesus is the real stuff. Here's the problem with this. There are people like the jailer in the world and in your life who don't know the answer to the question. What must I do to be saved, right? We can, if you've been a Christian all your life or whatever, you, you can very easily fall into the trap of like, well, I gotta get to the real stuff of following Jesus. I gotta get to the real practical, helpful thing. The problem with that thinking is that the world 
your workplace, your neighborhood, your schools are filled with people like the jailer who don't know the answer to the question. And so you and I have a responsibility as a Christian to be able to, like Paul, I'm going to encourage you this morning to be like the Apostle Paul. I know a lot of you are like, oh, I could never. But you know, you, you can do what Paul does today, which is give an answer to that question. What does it mean to be saved? How am I saved? How do I get salvation? However they want to ask it. So in our Lutheran tradition, we often will say, and especially if you go to kind of conventions or whether they're district or synodical or anything like that, you often hear the phrase from Lutheran theologians, this is what we believe, teach, and confess. Anybody heard that phrase before? If you went through confirmation, you heard it, then you might have forgotten it. But we say it a lot. We say, this is what we believe, teach, and confess. So what I want to do this morning is just walk you through those three things and why they matter for this question and the answer that we give. So the first is we have a responsibility to believe. And you're like, oh, pastor, I've been a Christian all my life. I already know the answer, right? So here's the answer. What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. As Luther's, we often say, it's, we're saved by faith, right? We are saved by the grace of God who creates faith in us. We are saved by faith in Jesus and nothing else. Now, before you just turn your brain off and go, well, I already know that. I would encourage you that you, you need to relearn it every day. It's what Luther taught. He often said, we, we need to hear the gospel every day because we forget it every day. When I was a vicar, which is like the best experience you'll ever have in ministry because you get to do all the pastor things and you can never get in trouble. It's awesome because you don't get in trouble as the vicar. You know where you go to complain? My supervisor's office. And you don't come to me, right? So it's like, like why'd you let him say that? God bless my supervisor, all right? <laughs> I got put in charge during my vicarage year, uh, my internship year, if you don't know what that word means. Um, and I got put in charge of teaching the new member class for our church. And it was awesome and it was a lot of fun. And because I like doing uh, social uh, sociology studies and, and surveying people, I've always been interested in that. I started doing that with members that were coming into our church and go, going through the class. And what I started asking people was just the basic question, like the jailer's question. I'd ask people like, okay, you say you're a Christian and you're gonna become a Lutheran, you wanna join our church. And so I just asked them, why do you think you are saved? Why do you think you're going to have, why do you think you're gonna have eternal life, right? All the variations of this question we could form. 90% of people gave me the exact same answer. This is the answer I got through a whole year wave of class after class. I believe in God, or Jesus, and I'm a good person. Number one answer, 90% of the people I asked. Now on the surface, if you walked out on the streets, most people would tell you what? That sounds like a good answer. That's what most people are going to say. I believe in God. I'm trying to be a good person. And a lot of people will actually just cut off the God part and just say, I'm just trying to be a good person. Now, here's the problem with that. And you ought to know, if, if you're ignoring me earlier, the problem with that is that's not the answer the Bible gives. When the jailer asks Paul, what must I do? to be saved. Paul doesn't tell him, I need you to believe in Jesus and then go be a good person. What does the Bible say in verse 31? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will what? You will be saved. And here is why we need to believe that. I meet a lot of Christians who forget it. And you will too at times. We are obsessed with the sentence, what must I do? We don't like grace. We like to talk about it. We like the idea of it. But we don't like it because what do we want to do as human beings? We want to earn it, right? I don't need help. 
Right? I meet a lot of people, you're, you're a wonderful congregation. You're all ready to help people and serve people in awesome ways. How many of you are ready to be like, I want to be the one being served and being helped. I want to be the one that appears to be in need. It affects our pride as humans. We don't like it. So we get obsessed with the, what must I do? And we think, there's got to be a little bit of something I can do to help God out. There's got to be just a, a little bit I could do to make sure and have confidence that I am saved. And the good news of the gospel is what Paul says when he says, all you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. There's no extra steps after it. There's no demands on the jailer after what Paul says, just believe in Jesus. And you know why? Because at Good Friday when Jesus is on the cross, he declares and he shouts out, it is finished. I mean, it's accomplished. It's complete. There's nothing lacking in the work of Christ on the cross that you need to add to or, um, or complete or finish. He finished it all for you. And you and I need to believe that. Just like the jailer did. We need to wake up every day and remind ourselves, this is what I believe that I am saved by the grace of Jesus, that I am saved by the complete work of Christ on the cross. And the Augsburg Confession is part of the Book of Concord. It's the official uh, teachings of our church body. In Article 4 on justification, it's the idea of salvation. We say this, this is what we believe, teach, and confess as Lutherans. People are freely justified for Christ's sake, meaning we are freely saved, we are freely made righteous, we are freely redeemed, by the work of Christ, through faith, when they believe that they are received into favor and that their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. What we officially believe and teach confess, what we believe the Bible teaches is verse 31. That people, whether it's Lydia, the demon-possessed girl, or the jailer, or it's you or me or anybody you know, are saved and freely forgiven and justified and made whole by the work of Christ. And then verse 31 ends. Paul doesn't add on to it. Article 4 in the book of Concord ends. Just here it is. Here is the gospel of what do we believe. All right, so the first thing is we actually have to believe it for ourselves that you are redeemed and forgiven by believing in Jesus and he has done all the work for you. You don't have to beat yourself up anymore. You don't have to burden your soul anymore. You don't have to add on. You don't have to tell yourself, I gotta do this to make God happy. No, God already perfectly loves you and is pleased with you. All you have to do is believe in Jesus. So we believe. Second, we teach, right? Our second prayer before every sermon is that we're praying for who? Our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because as much as you and I may forget it sometimes, guess who else is guilty of forgetting that we're saved by Jesus? The people sitting next to you in the pews, guys. (laughs) That wasn't a trick one. You're not going to make them feel bad. They already know it. (laughs) Okay. Right? Our brothers and sisters in Christ also need to be encouraged and reminded of the gospel. If you read Paul's letters, right, the Apostle Paul, who we all love, guess who he's writing to all those letters? Christians. He's writing to church. He's writing to people who already believe. And one of the common things he'll say is, I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, of what? And he'll go on and talk about, I want to remind you of Jesus. I want to remind you of what he's done for you. See, just as often as we forget it, we have a responsibility to love our neighbor, to love our brothers and sisters of Christ by reminding them of who Jesus is of what he has done for them. All right, so one of the cool things about this story is how it happened spontaneously. I promise you, Paul and Silas were not walking through the city of Philippi going, oh, you know what we're going to do later this week? Get arrested. That wasn't on their calendar, right? They didn't get a notification on their iPhone that said, hey, today's the day. Make sure you make a big scene so you can get jailed so we can finish the chapter, right? They're going along, sharing the gospel, and circumstances happen to them. 
And in verse 25, you go back to verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And we kind of, most commentators assume the jailers would have heard as Paul and Silas were probably doing this, not just at midnight, but throughout the whole stay in the prison cell. So what are they doing? They're taking every opportunity that comes their way to do what? Share the gospel of Jesus, the good news of how he saves people with anybody that'll listen. One of the fun things to do as a pastor is to do weddings, depending on who you're marrying, okay? Like, <laughs> sometimes they're really fun, and other times you're like, wow, you're kind of stressing me out. All right, but <laughs> for the most part, weddings are a good time. And the most favorite wedding I ever did was for my best friend, Paul, and his wife, Mary. Um, because they're such good friends, because they came to faith in Jesus uh, through a ministry that Laura and I did in our apartment in Washington, D.C. So it was cool to see people come to faith in Jesus and then go, hey, will you do our wedding one day? And it was also really cool because they live in Colorado, and so it was on a horse ranch in the Rocky Mountains. And so that was the backdrop for all the photos. It was awesome, all right? <laughs> While we were there, I'm meeting members of his family, and one of his brothers has a young uh, toddler who's never been baptized. Now, here's what happens everywhere I go when people find out that I'm a pastor. Either they go to church all the time and they want to tell me about their church and their pastor. Okay. <laughs> or, more commonly, they go, but, you know, I haven't really gone to church. I mean, I believe because they're trying to like not embarrass themselves in front of the pastor. Like, but I haven't been to church in like forever. So what I've started doing to mess with people because I get annoyed at this interaction and I'm just like, well, let's make it weird, is I'll take out my phone and pretend to start writing their names down. I'm like, oh, well, yeah, and how long has it been? Three years? Okay, I'll tell God. All right. <laughs> and I'm not really going to do that. I'm just messing with them, all right? So anyway... <laughs> Here's what happens. We're at the rehearsal dinner. And of course, his brother and sister-in-law with the young child come up to me and they're like, oh, a pastor's here. Cool. Where can you find those? In church, which you don't go to. Anyway. <laughs> We're, okay. And they start talking to me. They're like, well, you know, hey, like, hey, what do you think about baptizing our daughter? I'm, I mean, like, I'm into baptism. That's like, I don't, I'm, I'm for baptism. I don't know what you want me to say in this moment. All right, we have a conversation at the rehearsal dinner, time and party as the family's together, about faith and, you know, they're not going to church, but they, all, that, all that stuff that people always want to awkwardly say in front of a pastor, and we, so we start talking about it. Now, here's the reality. I have a choice to make in this moment. I can either tell them, hey, you really need to get to church and do all these things and become a member and do this and this and this, and then the baptism can happen, right? That's a choice to make, right? It's a similar to question, right? The jailer asked Paul and Silas, hey, what must I do to be saved? You know they had a choice on how to answer that question, right? They could have told him, well, you need to do this, this, and this, you got to become a member and all these things, and then, and then we'll baptize and all that. So I, I tell them about scripture, I tell them about Jesus, I tell them here's what I believe and here's what the Bible says about baptism, what it means to see what, what, what do you all believe about it? Because like pastors don't do baptism for hire, we're not just running around with squirt guns like, hey, here's some water, okay? It doesn't work that way. I said, I need you to take some time, which by the way, like I'm there for one more day, so it's not like I give them a lot of time. Right, to think about it and pray about it. So the next day is the wedding and the ceremony happens and everything. And, and, and my favorite part of the pastor is I get a free meal at the rehearsal dinner or at the wedding reception and it's great. And so everything's going awesome. And then partway through the reception, they sit down with me and we finish having the conversation. Of, of, right? And they confess faith in Jesus. They confess faith in what baptism is, and they go, this is what we believe, we're in agreement with it. Will you baptize our daughter now? And I was like, yeah, let's find some water. So we're in the mountains, and guess what is in mountains? Streams. So we got a 
party cup from the rehearsal dinner. I got a video of this where the dad's holding this, you know, big party cup with a label on it and everything. And we dip that in the coldest water I've ever baptized a human being with, mountain river water, right? And hold it there and we read some scripture. We declare what baptism is. And there you go. Haley got baptized and became a child of God. Now, this is what I mean by we have a responsibility to teach our brothers and sisters the faith. You, you never know when the opportunities to share the gospel, even with somebody like that, who is familiar with it, knows about church, knows about Jesus, but maybe they need a good reminder. They need an encouragement of, here's how free the gospel really is for you. It's not always planned out. Paul and Silas were like, you know, on Tuesday we're going to jail and we're going to save the jailer. I was going to do my friend's wedding. I didn't bring a baptismal font with me. It's like, just in case. Okay? But here's the reality. Your brothers and your sisters in Christ need to hear about Jesus too. We all need reminders. And so we need to be prepared. This is why it's so important for you and I to to know and believe the gospel ourselves so that when we hear somebody, we can correct them, we can encourage them, say, and actually, this is what the Bible really says about Jesus and his love for you. Which leads to our third point. This is what we believe, this is what we teach, and this is what we confess. Another word for confess is to to say witness, right? The Bible, Jesus tells us, you're gonna be my witnesses, right? So confession is to make a public statement and say, to the world, not just here in church, but to the world. This is what I believe, right? And so they go to the jail. It's not planned. It's not how they would have probably wanted it to go, but they saw an opportunity to share the gospel. They saw people who needed to hear about Jesus and his free love for them, and they said, you know what? That's what we're going to do. See, if we Remind ourselves every day, this is what we believe. This is what the gospel is. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. If we get into the habit of sharing that with one another, teaching it to our children, our grandchildren, teaching it to ourselves and our peers, teaching it to people that are older than us, reminding them, here's what the gospel is according to God's word. It's a lot easier when you get out there (laughs) and the unexpected opportunities come forward and you go, oh, I have an opportunity here to share the gospel. Because I promise you, you're gonna meet a lot of people in your life asking the jailer's question, what must I do to be saved? And a lot of them are getting the wrong answer. Sometimes they're getting the wrong answer from people who claim to be Christians. Y'all, you gotta clean up your act. You gotta live better. You gotta do this and that first. You gotta do these things. You gotta jump through all these hoops, become like me, and then, you could be saved. Or another way that's most commonly heard, you just gotta believe in God and be a good person. And dear friends, the reason it's so important for you and I to know the gospel and get it right in our own hearts is because people like the jailer in the world, when they're asked the question, what must I do to be saved? What is Christianity really about? We gotta be prepared to be able to say, it's actually about Jesus. Right, like my mentor told me all those years ago, if you just keep talking about Jesus, you'll be okay. That's really good advice, not just for preachers, but for you and me and everywhere we go to share the gospel, to remind people, this is what it's about. This is what we believe, teach, and confess. It's about Jesus, that all you have to do is believe in him and you will be saved. And how do I know that's good enough? Is because by later on in the chapter, what happens is Paul goes to his house and he baptizes him and his whole family and says, you're in. That's it, you're in. First Peter chapter three, verse 15 says it this way. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Right? Now here's the encouraging thing. That has nothing to do with you memorizing Leviticus has nothing to do with you memorizing the whole book of Psalms. It has nothing to do with you being a fantastic theologian. It has to do with you knowing Jesus. 
with you believing I am saved because I believe in Jesus by his grace and all of his work at the cross, it's 100% done. I don't add anything to it. That's it. If you know that and you believe that, you can do what Paul did and you can do what Peter tells us to do. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's in you because, dear friends, the hope that's in you is what? It's Jesus. It's his grace. It's his work on the cross. And so when we go out in the world and someone asks, what do I need to do to be saved? Or why do you believe in Jesus? Well, what's your hope? Where's your joy come from? You just say, well, it's all about Jesus. It's about his work on the cross. I want to close with a story from Alistair Begg. He is a phenomenal preacher and theologian. He also has a really amazing Scottish accent. So everything he says automatically sounds way cooler than anything I say. But... In the gospel reading, the very famous story of Jesus on the cross with the two criminals, the two robbers, these different translations, right? There's one on his right, one on his left, and one continually mocks Christ, right? You're familiar with this story? Mocking him like everybody else is mocking him, saying, if you're really the Savior, get off the cross, save yourself, save us, and all these things, and it kind of seems to go on and on for a while. And then the other criminal, the other thief, looks at Jesus on the cross, and he says to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's it. He just says one prayer, one request of Christ on the cross. I need you to remember me when you get into heaven. Now, the natural instinct of the human heart is what must I do to be saved? What must I do? And this story is a powerful reminder of what the answer is. You just believe in Jesus and you will be saved. How much time do you think the thief on the cross had to fix his life up, make amends, learn about church membership and the doctrine of faith and all and the sola scriptura and all these wonderful things that we believe? The answer is none. All he had time to do is what? Believe in Jesus on the cross for him. So Alistair Begg tells a story in one of his sermons. He says he would like to meet the thief on the cross when he gets to heaven and just ask him, how did that play out for you? Right, because we have the the popular image that when you get to heaven, an angel or St. Peter's going to ask you like at the gates of heaven, like why should you get in? Right, like how did you get in? And so Alistair Begg tells the story of the, imagining the thief on the cross getting to heaven and the angels looking at him and saying, well, how did you get here? And the thief cross going, I don't know. Like I, I was on the cross and now I'm here. I have, I have no idea how I got here. And the angel begins to ask him all kinds of doctrine questions like, well, what do you know about the doctrine of justification? The thief on the cross said, Never heard of it. <laughs> well, what do, you, what do you know about the inerrancy of Scripture and sola scriptura? He's like, uh, I don't know. He's never heard, those are big words. Never heard of them. The angel's like, so, like, what did you do to get here? And Randall and Theo Cross just keeps saying, I, I don't know. I just, I'm just here. I was on the cross next to Jesus, and now I'm here. So Alice Bay goes on and says, so the angel just looks at him, gets confused, and goes, I need to talk to my supervisor. And he goes and gets his supervisor angel and a bunch of other angels. They start asking him all kinds of questions. Like, it's like, what happened? Like, why are you here? And eventually the thief on the cross looks at the angel and says, I don't know the answer to any of your questions. All I know is the man on the middle cross said I could be here. And that's the gospel. The man on the middle cross said, I could come. And here I am. See, there is a world filled with people that live sinful lives. We call them sinners. We also call them human beings. They're you and me, right? The thief on the cross did what, y'all? He lived a sinful life. He didn't even get a chance to make amends. He didn't get a chance to clean up his act. He didn't get a chance to live like you and do all the wonderful things that you do. There's a world filled with sinners in need of grace. There's a world filled with people like the jailer going, what must I do to be saved? And what you and I as Christians believe, teach, and confess to the whole world is, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. 
The man on the middle cross did all the work for you. The man on the middle cross said, you are forgiven and loved and redeemed and you have eternal life because of his name being Jesus. So that's what you need to know and believe. The man on the middle cross loves you and forgives you. He's done all the work. It's what your brothers and sisters need you to encourage them with and uplift them with. And it's what the world filled with thieves on the cross, filled with jailers asking the question of salvation, needs you and me to go out in the world, confess, and say, this is the way of salvation. The man on the middle cross did all the work for you. Jesus has forgiven you and redeemed you, and he says you can come home to heaven. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your grace and mercy in our lives, that the answer to the question, what must we do to be saved, is simply to believe and trust in your grace and mercy, to believe and trust in your work on the cross, that it is completely done, and that the work of salvation is a gift to us and to all who trust in you. In your name we pray. Amen.